In this lecture, we continue our series of treatments of early Christian theology after the New Testament. We're going to look now at Christian reading. Christian reading is an interesting topic because there's an interesting problem that the early Christian church has. The great church, that Catholic or universal church that was spread throughout the world, a bunch of churches in communion with each other, rejecting these Gnostic sects or heresies that are anti-Jewish, think that the Jewish God is evil, the great church is now largely Gentile, and they affirm the goodness of the God of the Jews, that he's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that therefore, as Gentile believers, they are worshiping the Jewish God, and they're worshiping a Jewish Messiah, and they read the Jewish scriptures, now called the Old Testament, as their own scriptures. Jewish scriptures for Gentile believers. That's a problem. It's also, I think, we have to be aware, this is, this is really pretty astonishing. It's, it, we, we take it for granted that most Christians are Gentiles nowadays, but that's a, an astonishing development, you see, and that, that's what creates these problems. Here are these Gentiles looking back at the Jewish scriptures where God makes promises to his people Israel and warns them and threatens them and punishes them and, and, and comforts them. All these, this is a deep relationship between the God of Israel and his people, and Gentiles insert themselves into this story as if they're God's people too because of their faith in Christ, which is, again, that was Paul's key point. Gentiles, by having faith in Christ, become believers incorporated into the story of Israel and Israel's God so that the promises that the God of Israel makes to his people become promises to Christians, even if they're Gentiles, through faith in Christ. But that means that these Gentile Christians got to figure out how to read these Jewish scriptures. And that includes, by the way, the New Testament, which in one sense are Jewish scriptures because they're scriptures written all by Jews. So the whole Bible through and through, Old Testament and New Testament, is a, is a Jewish production. And here are these Gentile Christians reading it as their own scriptures. How can they do this? Well, there's a, a lot of problems to face and a lot of interesting issues to raise. Now, uh, biblical scholars love to talk about what's called hermeneutics, which is a theory of interpretation. And that's one of the issues we'll be sort of circum cir circumnavigating around in this lecture. But I want to focus primarily on the practice rather than the theory of reading. I will say a little bit about the theory, but the practice is really what matters. Christians had to practice reading, and that's why the, I'm going to focus on the notion of reading rather than the notion of interpretation. How do Gentile Christians read the Jewish scriptures? Well, let's start with um, a typical way of dividing up the Jewish scriptures. You can speak of law and prophets. Now, the law is the law of Moses. The prophets include people like Isaiah, Jeremiah, much of the bulk of the Old Testament. Christians felt more on sort of firm ground with the prophets than, than with the law. The prophets they, they read as predicting the coming of Christ, predicting the Messiah. The Psalms also they read as prophecies of Christ. So prophecy the Christians really liked. They, th they thought they knew what to do with that, that part of the Hebrew scriptures. The law, law was more difficult. Typically and fairly early on, the church divided the Mosaic law into two parts moral law and ceremonial law. The moral law being things like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, that's part of the Jewish law. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, and strength. That's part of the Jewish law. And Jesus repeated it and Christians believed it. That part was not a problem, but the ceremonial law, that's more difficult. All these sacrifices, dietary laws, circumcision. Remember Paul had said, Gentiles don't have to get circumcised in order to be uh, Christian believers. So the Jewish ceremonial law is not applied literally to Gentiles, and yet it's still part of the scriptures which the Gentile Christians honor as God's word. So they, they read these scriptures but don't apply them literally. And as a result, of a whole lot of early Christian reading of scripture pushes in a non-literal direction, pushes away from literalism. Um, the, the motto for this push away from literalism is a passage in the letter of second letter to Corinthians by Paul that goes, the letter kills, the spirit gives life. The letter, 
the litera, right? Literal comes from a Latin word for letter. So the literal, the letter, kills. The spirit gives life. So the non-literal reading that many Christians practiced and many Christian churches practiced was called a spiritual reading. Let me say a little bit about literalism um, because it seems to me there's two possible crude mistakes to make about literalism. On the one hand, you can talk as if every literalist is some kind of ignoramus, some uh, fundamentalist ignoramus or something. Well, okay, literalism is not the same thing as ignorance. Right? There, the, the, the church retains a commitment to the literal truth of the narratives of scripture and so on. The, the early church read the, the scriptures literally in the sense of saying, oh, these things really happened. On the other hand, one shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that you have to take a text literally in order to take it seriously. As one church father argued, if you take it literally when Genesis says that God walked in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the evening, if you take that literally, you're not taking the text seriously. God doesn't literally walk in gardens in the cool of the evening. That's not a serious way of reading the text and learning what it has to say. So taking the text literally is sometimes a way of not taking it seriously. So don't confuse literal reading with with serious reading, especially not for early Christians. Now let's say a little bit about how Christians read the Jewish scriptures in detail. Let's think about some prophecies. And again, the Psalms are often, often a very crucial form of prophecy for the Christians. Psalm 22, for instance, here's a famous one. Psalm 22 in the Jewish scriptures begins like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a very familiar passage for Christians because in the Gospels, Jesus utters this phrase on the cross. Evidently, he was praying this psalm on the cross, or at least he he remembered this particular line. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the psalm goes on. Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? For dogs encompass me, a company of evil doers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Christians love that bit. I can count all my bones. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. That's an episode that's narrated in the Gospels. So Christians just love this bit. And then they argued with non-Christian Jews about this. For instance, you know, the line about uh, they have pierced my hands and my feet. Some Hebrew manuscripts and the Greek and the Syriac versions of the Hebrew scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, uh, have that line about piercing hands and feet. Most of the Hebrew manuscripts of the Jewish scriptures say, that have the line reading something like, uh, like a lion at my hands and feet, um, picking up the imagery of the dog. So, so remember, the dogs sur- surround me, lions are at my hands and feet, and most Jewish readers say, these Christians got it wrong. The right text doesn't talk about piercing hands and feet. And so Christians and Jews would argue about this. And this argument with the Jews about the meaning of the Jewish scriptures is a typical feature of early Christian reading of the scriptures. They can argue about whether the Jewish scriptures really do predict the coming of Jesus. Probably the crucial point of argument between Jews and Christians about the prophecies is about the notion of a Messiah that suffers. For, of course, Jewish, non-Christian readings of the Jewish scriptures did believe that there were prophecies of the Messiah in the Jewish scriptures, but prophecies of a Messiah who's going to get crucified? That's where most Jewish readers got off the boat. And, and of course, Gentile Christians would insist, oh yes, a crucified, suffering Messiah. This form of Christian reading is traced back in the Gospels all the way to Jesus himself in his, res- um, in his appearances after his resurrection. There's a story in the Gospel of Luke about how he opened the minds of his disciples, says the text. He opened the mind of his disciples to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, and here's the Gospel of Luke again, thus it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, that is, to the Gentiles, beginning from Jerusalem. So. Christians traced this uh, reading of the Jewish prophets as prophesying a suffering Messiah. Um, They traced this form of reading back to Jesus himself. It's Jesus himself raised from the dead who teaches Christians how to read the Jewish scriptures properly as prophecies of a suffering Messiah. 
Um, we are used to thinking of prophecy as a kind of prediction, and certainly there were early Christians who read the Jewish prophets as predicting Christ, but that's probably not the best way to bring into focus what these prophets are doing for um, Christian readers. Most fundamentally, what the prophets provide for early Christian readers is something like the backstory of the identity of Jesus. The prophecies help Christian readers understand who Jesus is. Jesus is the man who says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's the fulfillment of that psalm. That psalm is about Jesus, um, whether, he, whether it's a prediction or not. I mean, after all, is it a prediction? Jesus said this on the cross. Does that make it a prediction? Um, anyone can say these words. Does that make it a prediction? So the thing to do is to, to set aside the notion of whether this proves that Jesus is the Messiah and just focus on how it helped Christians understand who Jesus is. That, I think, was the primary function of Christian readings of ancient Jewish prophecy. It's about the identity of Jesus. So, for instance, you have what is the most important um, Old Testament text for the Christian church in the early centuries, Psalm 110. Here's how it goes. The Lord, this is the name of the God of Israel, said to my Lord, this is Adonai, not the name of the Lord, uh, not the name of the God of Israel, so the Lord, the God of Israel, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So there's that picture that's fundamental for early Christian theology, Jesus as Lord sitting at the right hand of the Lord God. Sit at my right hand, says the psalm, until I, God, make your enemies your footstool. The Lord has sworn and will not take it back, saying, you are a priest forever. So Jesus sitting at God's right hand is the priest, right there in the psalm. And of course, you see, Christians read these psalms in church, chanted them in church just like uh, Jewish uh, synagogue worship, and of course, when they read and chanted these psalms, they were applying them to Jesus. That liturgical setting is really the important thing to understand, right? not whether it's proving it or, or whether it proves that Jesus is the Messiah, but Christians using the Jewish scriptures to, decide, to portray the identity of Jesus at God's right hand. Likewise, that passage in Daniel 7 where the Son of Man comes on the clouds, uh, very frequently used in the Gospels. Jesus is the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven because, again, he's there with the Ancient of Days, says Daniel 7, right? and, and the Son of Man, Jesus, is on the clouds of heaven with the Ancient of Days in this picture from Daniel 7. So that tells you who he is. That's the, the primary function of prophecy for these Christian readers. Now, there's another very interesting feature of Christian reading of the Jewish scriptures, which I need to give a label to and discuss at some length. This label I'll call typology. This is a standard label for a way that Christians read the scriptures. Typology comes from the word typos, from which we get the word type. Um, the Latin translation of this Greek word is figura, from which we get the word figure. Um, it, it, it's, it, the type is originally the same word as typewriter. Imagine a, a, an impression made by a type, right? So you have the type and then the impression of the type, which is called the antitype. You have the figure and then you have the fulfillment of the figure. You have a type in the Old Testament, say King David, and then you have the fulfillment of that type, the antitype as it's called, which is Jesus. So you have the type, the antitype, the, the uh, original um, version of it, and then its impression. But actually the antitype, it turns out, is the, the, real, the, the, the real thing, the most real thing. So it's as if the, the impression that the type makes is what it's all about. Right? The type, David, King David, helps you understand who Jesus is. He's important because he helps you understand the identity of Christ. But all these types or figures in the Old Testament prefigure Jesus. So typological reading is a way of looking back in the Old Testament for prefigurations of Jesus, like David, the king of the, of the Jews, like the prophets, like Moses, who also is a type of Jesus as a prophet and a priest. Um, this typology is, I think, virtually an inevitable feature of Christian readings of the Old Testament. Um, if Christianity is true, if Jesus really is the Christ, then he's going to be the, the fulfillment of the messianic promises to David, and things said about King David will be true of Christ. For instance, in Psalm 72, we hear this, 
Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. May he judge your peoples with righteousness and your poor with justice. You can imagine Christians reading this in church and they're thinking about Jesus. May he endure as long as the sun and as long as the moon throughout all generations. And Christian readers would come to, uh, to their Jewish um, counterparts and say, look, the Messiah lives forever. Right? That's Jesus. Um, so once again, um, a, 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 a psalm which any Jewish reader would say is about King David, Christians say it was about Jesus, it's also about King David, but primarily pointing forward to Jesus. How could Christians possibly read a psalm like this and not think about Jesus? So typology, as I suggest, this prefiguring of Jesus is something inevitable that Christians will find in the Old Testament scriptures if they believe in, in Christ at all. If Jesus is the Christ, he's the fulfillment of the messianic promises to David, he's the greatest of the prophets, and all the prophets of Israel are in that sense prefigurations, types of Christ. Christ's Sermon on the Mount is meant to remind us of Moses on Mount Sinai. Moses gives the law from Sinai, Christ brings the gospel in his Sermon on the Mount. His transfiguration happens on a mountain to remind us of Moses going up to the mount to see God. His miracles of healing, it turns out, resemble the miracles made by Elijah and Elisha, who were northern prophets in the, about the same place of where Jesus was um, working in Galilee. Likewise, if Jesus is the Christ, then the church, his body, his community, is going to be the fulfillment of the identity of Israel. Things said about Israel in the Old Testament will be true of the church. Promises made to Israel will be promises made to the church. This typology, this typological reading, also ends up becoming the key to interpreting the ceremonial law. Right? The, the Gentile Christians are not going to f observe the ceremonial law. What they will do is they'll read the passages about the sacrifices under the Mosaic law and say, ah, these sacrifices which make atonement are about Christ who offered himself as a sacrifice on the cross and his blood made atonement for us the way the blood of the sacrifices under Mosaic law made atonement um, and cleansed the, the altar uh, of the sin of the people. Likewise, if Christians seriously believe that Jesus' death has the power to save, then inevitably they're going to think of him as something like the true Passover lamb. And of course this imagery of Jesus as the lamb of God is, is throughout the New Testament pretty much inevitable. He's the Paschal lamb, he's the Passover lamb, he was slaughtered on Passover and his blood drives away evil and death, just like the blood of the lamb, uh, of the Passover lamb was put on the lintels of the doors of the, the Jewish people that kept them safe from the, the plague against the firstborn in Egypt. And uh, like the Passover lamb, his bones are not broken on the cross. This is a passage in the Gospel of John. So uh, this kind of identifying Jesus with these precursors or prefigurations in the Old Testament is virtually inevitable. Um, some of the typologies are less inevitable but still a deep part of the Christian tradition. For instance, Christ identifies his body with the temple. There's a passage in John where Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And people didn't understand. He was talking about his body. Right? Destroy this temple, my body, and in three days it will raise, be risen from the dead. So Jesus' body is like the, the place of worship, the place where Christians come to find the presence of God the true temple. Likewise, we've heard about Jesus' flesh being the bread of life, like the true manna from heaven. That's in the Gospel of John. We hear Jesus being the, the good shepherd. Christians can't read, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, Psalm 23, without thinking of Jesus as the good shepherd. How could they possibly be sitting there worshiping Christ and hearing about the Lord is my shepherd and not think of the Lord Jesus? And likewise, there's a fascinating passage in uh, the first letter to Corinthians by Paul where he talks about the rock that Moses got water from. As, as the Israelites were wandering in the desert, Moses struck a rock with his staff and water came from the rock. And Paul says, that rock was Christ. Now there's typology for you. The rock prefigures Christ, the rock of our salvation, from which flows the water of life. That's typology. Um, another typology, uh, there's, well, what I'm getting at is some of these typologies are rooted already in the New Testament. There's some typologies that come about later, um, not directly New Testament typology. For instance, the Red Sea 
is a type or prefiguring of baptism. When the Jews go through the, the Red Sea and escape from Pharaoh, that's like Christians going through baptism and coming out of the water as a new people, as a new nation. Uh, a favorite post-New Testament typology is Noah's Ark. The wood of the Ark prefigures the wood of the cross. Christian writers love that. That's not in the New Testament itself, but uh, you can see why they would love it. Now, some of the typologies can get fairly fanciful. Right? It's clear the Old Testament writers writing about Noah's Ark were not thinking directly about the cross. But all of them are based in some way on the literal sense of the text. The typologies do not abolish the literal meaning of the text. Because, in fact, the prefigurations of Christ are typically not words but persons. Right? Um, the story of David prefigures Christ because David himself, the person David, King David, prefigures Christ. So the typology is actually built on the narrative which Christians, early Christians, typically took quite literally. There's a, there's, you know, the, the story of David is literally true, literally happened, David's a real person, and he also is a figure um, prefiguring um, Christ. So typology is a form of figurative meaning where what has figurative meaning in typology is not so much the words as the persons. David has a figurative meaning. Moses has a figurative meaning, even though they are both literal historical people in early Christian reading. So typology is consistent with, uh, coherent with, uh, taking the narrative literally as well. Another thing about typology um, that's, I think, very important is it's typology is, is deeply woven into the way the scriptural text works already in the Jewish scriptures. Um, take the book of Genesis, for instance. Uh, Genesis has often been called the Old Testament of the Old Testament. <laughs> it's the Old Testament of the Jewish scriptures because it's the ancient past. So figures in Genesis often prefigure later figures in Israel. Jacob, for instance, who is renamed Israel, he becomes a figure of the people of Israel. Abraham becomes, uh, prefigures the people of Israel. He goes down into Egypt, he comes back out of Egypt, he prefigures the Exodus. Um, the, the figure of Judah, the, one of the sons of Jacob, um, one of the sons of Israel, one of the twelve sons of Israel who become the ancestors of the twelve tribes of Israel. Judah is the ancestor of King David, and what happens to Judah in the book of Genesis prefigures King David. So typology is already there in the Hebrew Scriptures. It's not something that the New Testament um, imposes on the he Hebrew Scriptures in an alien uh, or external fashion. I, I think it's a continuation of the way the Hebrew Scriptures already read themselves. Now, more controversial, I think, is another form of Christian reading called allegory. Um, as I say, typology is inevitable for Christian readers. Um, no matter how literalist you are, you're going to read some things in the Old Testament scriptures uh, typologically. Right? No, the most literal fundamentalist in the world is going to read David, King David as a type prefiguring Christ. But allegory is a bit different. Allegory is a form of reading that developed originally with uh, pagan philosophers. Uh, for instance, you, you, remember, you think of yourself as a pagan philosopher participating in pagan worship and not taking this stuff literally. What do you do? Well, one thing you can do is interpret these pagan gods as symbols of things like, oh, I don't know, Apollo is a symbol of the sun, and uh, Saturn is a symbol of the sky, uh, Poseidon is a symbol of the sea, and so on and so forth. So you can um, interpret these pagan myths as symbolizing something else. That's what allegory is. It literally means something like um, other speaking. Right? You're speaking about the sea when you speak about Poseidon. You're speaking about the sun when you speak about Apollo. You're speaking other than literally. Allegory is always non-literal. It was developed by pagan philosophers. It gets into the Judeo-Christian tradition through an, a Jewish Platonist philosopher named Philo of Alexandria, a man born about 20 years before Jesus was born, died about 20 years after Jesus died. So roughly the same time as Jesus, but a longer lifespan. He lived to an old age, unlike Jesus. Philo of Alexandria, Jewish Platonist philosopher who reads the Jewish scriptures allegorically. Now, allegory, let me suggest, is different from typology because it has this it is fundamentally vertical, let me say. Typology is horizontal in the sense that it's, it's about binding together things in history, past and present. King David in the past, 
Jesus in the present, because Jesus is alive, not dead, right? Jesus is never in the past for Christians. So King David in the past, Jesus in the present, typology is this horizontal historical relationship. Allegory tends to be vertical. Um, Allegory tends to symbolize higher things, the soul's relation to higher things, so that allegories of the gods might be um, symbolizing the soul's relationship to higher truths. Sometimes it symbolizes the soul's relationship to virtue or wisdom or learning. The people who practiced allegory, like Philo of Alexandria, like the pagan philosophers, were very typically learned men who wanted to see reflections of their own learning and education in these difficult, hard-to-understand texts. Right? Um, when, you, when you're a learned man reading these ancient Jewish texts and not quite understanding what's going on, you know, God wants Abraham to slay his son. What's going on there? David is doing. David's involved in all these wars. I want him to be a virtuous man, not a, not a man of blood. How do I interpret this as a learned man, a scholar of the ancient world? Well, you'll often take, if you're a scholar like Philo of Alexandria, you'll take Abraham as symbolic of certain kinds of virtues. Isaac symbolizes certain virtues. Um, um, uh, Jacob symbolizes other virtues. And in Alexandria, a few centuries later, a Christian teacher named Origen picks up the allegorical tradition of interpretation. And what ends up happening is, is allegory never quite becomes pure allegory in Christianity. There's this vertical element, but then it gets mixed with the horizontal element. Let me illustrate. Origen reads the Song of Songs, which is in the Hebrew Scriptures. It's a love song. It seems to be quite a carnal love song. It seems to be about uh, a bride and a bridegroom who want to get together and get to bed together and are longing and sighing for each other. And Origen says, well, wait a minute. That can't be the proper reading of this text. It's really about the soul's love for God. Now, if he had stopped there, that would be pure allegory. Right? The man's love for his bride is an allegory for the soul's love for God. Right? Horizontal becomes vertical, soul loving higher things. But then he proceeds. Here's Origen again. This book of scripture then speaks of this love with which the blessed soul burns and is on fire in regard to the word of God. And she sings this wedding song through the spirit by which the church is joined and united with its heavenly bridegroom, Christ. What happens in Christian allegory is that Christ keeps getting into the picture and the allegory becomes mixed up with typology. You get a lot of what we might call impure allegory, not purely vertical because for Christians everything ends up being about Christ. So there's always typology in the area when Christians start doing allegory. Origen is a great example of that. He does a lot of allegory. He's famous for allegorical reading, but you look carefully and a lot of these allegories turn out to be typologies. Some of this goes back all the way to um, the New Testament again. Uh, if you think of allegory as inherently vertical, there's a very famous vertical um, allegory in the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament where there's a, a heavenly tabernacle, a heavenly temple. Right? Uh, so the, so the, the, the temple on earth, the tabernacle on earth symbolizes a heavenly tabernacle. That's a very vertical allegory. But then what happens? Jesus, crucified, goes up to heaven and he sprinkles his blood in the heavenly altar, in the heavenly sanctuary. Jesus' literal, physical, human blood is up there in heaven, in this spiritual temple. So so instead of this spiritual, non-physical thing, you've got physical blood in a spiritual, heavenly temple. It's sort of impure allegory at its most impure. Allegory and typology, physical and spiritual, mixed up together because Christians are obsessed with Jesus. Allegory was useful because it was a way of dealing with hard texts. Philo, for instance, um, when he got to the texts about the dietary regulations, which he didn't quite know how to make sense of, said, well, there's this rule about um, uh, what's, what's, uh, what you can eat has to, be, um, has to chew the cud uh, or have cloven hoofs. Well, no, both, both chew the cud, cud and have cloven hoofs. What does that mean? Chewing the cud means you ruminate over what you've learned, right? Chewing the cud, sort of chewing over the text because early Christ, uh, all early ancient readers would, would chew over the text by, by murmuring it because they had to read aloud uh, when they read the text. Uh, the cloven hoof means to divide uh, and distinguish good from evil. That's pure allegory. It caught into the Christian tradition. Uh, many Christian readers use it. The wars and massacres 
uh, in the ancient Christian scriptures, or pardon me, the ancient Jewish scriptures. Here's Israel uh, fighting their enemies, sometimes even massacring their enemies. What does that mean? What does it mean, for instance, in the psalm, which says, O daughter of Babylon, blessed is he who takes your little ones and dashes them against a rock? That means, says Augustine, one of the church fathers, you must ruthlessly suppress and destroy your evil impulses while they're young, while they're small, before they grow big and strong. That's the real meaning of it. It's a way of dealing with this difficult text. Allegory is used to deal with difficult text. Origen uh, suggests that whenever you have a text that is absurd or immoral, if read literally, then you should read it allegorically. That's called the criterion of absurdity. It's often used by early Christian readers, especially by Origen, who's famous for allegorical reading. Now, the point of allegory, and I'll finish with this, the point of allegory is precisely not to reject the Old Testament, like the Gnostics or the Marcionites. It's to uh, to take hold or appropriate these Jewish scriptures, even though you may not be able to understand them on a literal level the way the ancient Jews did. So here's our origin again. You should not blame or reject scripture when it appears too difficult or too obscure to understand, or when it contains what either the beginner or the child or the weaker and feebler in his general understanding, that is, the non-scholar, right? What, what ordinary people cannot use or does not think will bring him anything useful or saving. Just because you're an ordinary person who doesn't quite get it, don't reject the Jewish scriptures. The learned people of the, of the church can give an allegorical reading so that we can still keep reading these Jewish scriptures as scriptures for the Christian church. And that becomes a fundamental feature of Christian spiritual reading down through the ages, into the Middle Ages, and into uh, much Christian exegesis and reading even today.